Hello. We are here. Yeah. Hi. I'm Erica. <laughs> and I'm Stephen, and we're from Brooklyn Brew Shop. And we're joining you today from our kitchen for a live brew day where we'll be brewing this milkshake IPA. Yeah, so we want to first thank you so much for joining us here on YouTube. Uh, quick, you know, housekeeping. Uh, you can ask us any questions. We'll be checking it out uh, as we go and answering them as they come in. Uh, today we're going to be making a batch of milkshake IPA right here, but really the instructions are really similar depending on what batch of beer you're making. Yeah, so we saw some comments already about people making Elvis juice or bourbon double. The steps are pretty much the same. It's just different grain, different hops going in at different times, but you'll get an overall gist of how, how we do it. And please, if you have any questions at all, shoot us, shoot us a quick little chat and I'll try and see it. And if not, I promise I'll go through all of them after and answer anything you have. And if you're watching this on brooklynbrewshop.com and not YouTube, and you're not sure what chat we're talking about, you can hit that link for YouTube and it'll bring you straight to the YouTube page and you'll get to chat along with everyone from, I, I can't, I lost count of how many countries people are watching from now. So yeah. we're really great. Thank you great for tuning in. people joining us. I want to thank you. Yeah. So the first step of brewing is called the mash and we started it ahead of time because your brew day takes about three and a half hours. Didn't think you all wanted to hang out with us that long. So we got this started a little bit ago um, and it's just been sitting on the stove, which is pretty much all the mash does. Steven's going to give you a closer look of that. Get a good look at it. So this has been going, I'll make sure you can still see Erica. <laughs> so this has been going already for just shy of an hour. And the mash is basically like making a big pot of oatmeal or porridge. So we heated up uh, two and a half quarts of water. So like two and a half liters basically as well for our international folks. And that's going to be one of the slight variations depending on what mix you're brewing. It's normally about two to two and a half quarts of water and that really goes to how much grain is in the recipe. And the more grain, the higher in alcohol it's going to be and the more water you're going to need to start with. So we started the brew day off by heating up this pot of water to 160 degrees, added in all our grain, and then now we've just been keeping it at a happy, like. 155, 154 um, for about an hour. If you have a pretty solid pot, you can shut the heat off and it's going to retain its temperature. Just check it every 10 minutes or so to make sure it didn't get too hot or too cool. If you're working with a temperamental stove or like a thinner aluminum pot that heats up and cools down really quickly, you'll have to keep a little closer eye on it. But if it gets too hot or too cold, it's nothing to freak out about. Too hot, move it off the burner and stir it, try and get that temperature down. If it's really high, add some cold water to it and just get it down. If it gets too cold, just turn the heat back on, maybe add on a little bit more time and do a 65 minute mash if you think it's been cold for a while. But other than that, nothing to freak out about if it's too hot or too cold um, for short amounts of time. If it's too hot the entire time, what you're doing is uh, just making some of that grain that we want to be fermentable sugar unfermentable so you'll end up with a sweeter less alcoholic beer which is still you know okay um, but not necessarily the beer that you were trying to make. And this whole um, hour-long process we're basically trying to convert starches from our grain into sugars because sugar is what becomes alcohol not really starches so that's what we're doing here that's why it takes 60 minutes um, and we're basically done. So even though you just joined us, um, we've been doing this because watching a pot is not the most fun. Brewing is a lot of inactive work. Um, you don't have to do a ton of labor. It's not um, super intensive. Uh, you don't have to talk, touch it all the time, which is a great thing about it. It means it's a great like weekend activity. You can kind of set it and like you know keep an eye on it every so often. But at the end of one hour, so at the end of your mash, you're going to do something called mashing out. Um, so to mash out, it means you're going to bring your grain up to 170 degrees Fahrenheit. You wanna do this pretty quickly, so we're just going to turn on the heat. 
And we had a good question. Somebody asked about keeping the lid on during the mash. And it, it really depends on your equipment and what you find works. So since this is a pretty heavy um, stainless steel, like triple clad stock pot, I got it to temperature and I put the lid on it um, and then checked it every few minutes. And it did a really good job of like did not moving really at all. It just had to turn on the heat really low, like once or twice in the course of an hour. Um, so obviously if your mash is getting a little too warm, then take the cover off. So it's the kind of thing where you'll, you'll learn a little bit as you go, but there's no, there's no reason one way or the other. Yeah. And, um, so lids during the mash are totally fine. You don't want to cover it during the boil, which we're going to get to in a little bit because that's when you want some things to actually like burn off. Um, but the mash, you're really just keeping it warm. If it was at a brewery, it would be a closed brew kettle. So a cover does not, is no way a bad thing. It's just about keeping it at the right temperature range. And so I am heating this up on like medium high heat right now. And while I'm doing this, I'm also going to heat up another gallon of water. So actually right behind this is another pot, which might be behind this pot and behind that pot. So we have, we have three pots going now, but you can, you can do this with, with two for the class. We just wanted to kind of minimize the amount of switching out of things we're doing. So while this grain is heating up to 170 degrees, we're also going to heat up a gallon of water to 170 degrees as well. And this in your instructions is called your sparge water. And the reason that you don't start the grain in a gallon plus two quarts of water to begin with is because it would just be floating around and not, not the right consistency. You really want kind of an oatmeal consistency that's giving that grain the best chance of converting those sugars to fermentable things. Um, so yes. so all, the, all the grain in here is, um, it's a mixture of malted barley, wheat, and oats. Um, you're not necessarily gonna have all of those grains in a, uh, in a batch of beer, but uh, the Milkshake IPA is, it's a, so as a style, it's a lactose New England IPA. So like a lactose IPA, it's a, it's a new style. If we were doing this class five years ago, it would the beer wouldn't exist really. So it's the great part about when you're making beer at home, you can, you can do the crazy stuff that you're getting at craft breweries. So it's got oats and it's got wheat because you want it to be super cloudy. Um, and oats and wheat, when they're in the mash, they kind of all just disintegrate. And um, yeah, and we just, um, we've got a couple good questions and comments. Uh, John just asked that he heard this tastes like an orange Julius, does it? <laughs> um, when we were making it, we were really designing kind of like a creamsicle beer. The hops are super orangey. Um, it has the lactose sugar that makes it creamy and then we add a vanilla bean which is totally optional but if you have it do it and i had to look up what an orange julius was um old old cool mall thing <laughs> but uh yes so super orangey smoothie like delicious i'm um, still a beer but really really tasty the other question we got was um whether it's okay that the fermenter was really cloudy two days in and absolutely so once you're fermenting your beer is going to look super murky it's not going to look appealing at all that's because all the yeast is doing what they're doing inside your fermenter as fermentation goes that yeast is going to settle out to the bottom and they're going to grab any hot particles any grain particles and then kind of condense uh to a pretty compact layer this is a bourbon double that we did a couple weeks ago and when it was fermenting it was actually a much lighter cloudier color and now it's uh pretty much ready to be bottled and you can see the yeast like settled down and while it's a very dark beer it is pretty clear and a whole lot less cloudy yeah so this beer in particular is going uh, to look kind of gross and by gross, I mean, it's going to look really cloudy. Yes. So. so I'm actually, I'm drinking a cloudy IPA, not one that we made. This one is a uh, Sloop Brewing out of New York. They're fantastic. And it is their super soft IPA, which has this cute little bear and a rainbow. Uh, and 
it gives you a good idea. So when you're making a New England style IPA or milkshake IPA, um, the goal is actually cloudy. You want all that kind of suspended grain matter, hop matter, because that's where you're getting all that hop flavor from in every single sip. So while some beers you want to be a little bit clearer, this is not one of them. Yeah. So, oh, somebody else just called out Sloop. They love them too. Yes. And that's a fun beer. It's actually an example of a no boil beer. So they don't actually boil it. And all the hops that go in are added basically at, um, during fermentation um, as dry hops. So it's, it's, a, it's a weird one. We might, we might come out with a no boil kit at some point. Uh, if anyone's curious to make their own. Um, somebody said they love my dress. Thank you so much. Uh, that's super nice. Uh, another question um, on whether we can use vanilla extract instead of a vanilla bean. Absolutely. It's just vanilla extracts a super strong flavor. So shoot us an email and we can send you the exact ratio of how much to add and when to add it. Um, and somebody has malt that's a year old. Can I use it? Yes, this is, if you're talking about grain, absolutely. Um, you want to just taste it first. It's kind of, grain doesn't go bad the way like meat or dairy would, where it would actually spoil. It just, like old cereal, might get a little bit stale. And so taste your grain before you brew with it. If it's metallic -y, tastes stale, tastes kind of like damp cardboard, that's what your beer's going to taste like, so you don't want to use it. But if it tastes kind of like an all-natural, like, kashi cereal, then totally brew with it. Yeah, our, our mixes are packed in really thick, uh, it's like four mil plastic, which is a, like a measurement of thickness. Um, so they do last quite a bit. Um, the yeast is something you just want to check on to make sure that that is within expiration date. And if not, you can send us an email at info at brooklynbrewshop.com and we will um, get back to you. Um, we'll get you a free pack. We'll figure something out um, so that you can brew. Um, and a couple, couple uh, quick questions using a grain bag instead of a strainer to to strain through yes still sanitize that um using priming sugar instead of honey absolutely just follow whatever ratio or shoot us an email we have a whole list of substitutions and how much you should use whether it's maple sugar or honey or agave or table sugar um so you just want to have the right ratio so you're not over carbonating your beer yeah uh, priming sugar is a little a little more fermentable so you'll want to use this, oh but. here's a great question is there a non-dairy solution for lactose sugar um no Lactose is, is a milk sugar, but to get a lot of that um, creaminess, you could use just the mix. It has a lot of oats in it, a lot of wheat that's going to give it that creamy body. Um, you could use another un, like less fermentable sugar for to make it a little bit sweeter. So something like, like a little maple syrup would add some sweetness. Um, it wouldn't do the same exact thing, but... Lactose is a milk sugar, so if you're going dairy free, definitely don't don't put the lactose yeah. in there. Yeah, and, and confirming um, people that are lactose intolerant should not drink a milk stout or a lactose IPA. Um, so just just so you know that yes, it is it is the same lactose, um, but leave it, if you leave it out, it's a New England IPA by definition. It's really creamy. The oats and the wheat uh, make sure of that. Otherwise, you can try to experiment with like stevia and all sorts of like sugars that aren't gonna, that aren't quite sugars and won't ferment, but it'll still give you some sweetness. Um, we don't have any specific information off the top of our heads on what to do, but we can um, uh, email you. More questions. Big strainer, you can you can get it at brooklynbrewshop.com. We love it. We carry it. We use it yeah, every day. So, just so you see, this is a 10 inch strainer so it's 10 inches from here to here we really like this it's pretty fine mesh um, it'll do a good job of filtering out all the grain um, by definition malted barley already wants to be a filter because it has really thick um, husks it's like a shell and all the grain that goes into your mash has been cracked by us so it's all pre-cracked um, and what that does is makes it so that it really um, does a good job of filtering out. It's it's why we always use, it's why barley is uh, used by breweries. And this strainer I love because because it's stainless steel, you can use it for cheese making as well. We line it with cheesecloth, make yogurt with it. Um, if you really like fermentation projects, you'll end up using it for a lot more than just beer. Yeah, we made uh, goat yogurt <laughs> with yeah. this uh, just three days ago. If you want to learn how to make other fermentation projects, yeah. go to... Um, 
go to our other YouTube channel when this is done. It's um, at Farmsteady. That's um, Farmsteady, just how you say it. Yeah, and, um, and I'm there weekly posting new videos for fermented hot sauces, kombucha, uh, pickles, pickled carrots, different sauerkraut recipes. And so if you're into non-alcohol fermentations, uh, check out Farmsteady. Um, but also, clearly, we like beer. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we're okay. making beer today. Yeah. Oh, good questions about grain. Uh, so we're about to, to finish off the mash, mashing out right now. We'll do the sparge. And after that, you're done with your grain. And it's called spent grain at, at that point. And we're getting lots of questions about whether you can compost it. Um, yes, it's great compost. It counts as a brown, so kind of like fall dead leaves. Um, it does that. Uh, in composting, it's either browns or greens, and you're supposed to layer them. So it's great that it's a non-fall brown. Uh, chickens do also love it. Somebody pointed that out. And at brooklynbrewshop.com in our blog section, The Mash, we have over 50 spent grain recipes. So we can, you can use this spent grain to make a pizza dough today. You can dry it out, mill it into a flour. It's, um, it's really great because uh, it makes beer and then it's kind of a bonus ingredient. So yeah. definitely, don't throw it up unless you have to, um, but if you can compost it, that's great. And if you want to cook with it, check out brooklynbrewshop.com, the mash, and there's over 50 recipes there. Yeah, and we posted a bunch of helpful links in the YouTube description, uh, mainly like how to find the Milkshake IPA mix, how to find the full PDF instructions if you want to read along with us, uh, a profile on the Mandarina Bavaria hops, which we'll get to, and we'll make sure when this is done, we'll add a link to the Spent Grain Chef section of our website too, so you can make um, anything you want with spent grain. Uh, so somebody sous vides their mash, which I've had, I've like, I've read about as well. We haven't done it, even though we have one of those. We little... have a sous vide stick ready to go, but um, it, it, it makes it makes total sense. Um, yeah. With the mash, you are just going for temperature control, so sous vide your mash is, um, it's great if, if, you, if it works for you. Cool, but we can start the sparge yeah. If y'all, if y'all don't mind, um, so we heated this up to 170 degrees, and uh, likewise, the pot behind it is a gallon that's also been heated up to 170 degrees. And right now, I'm just gonna pour the grain into this strainer. Get a good look at that. We got another question: whether using a mesh bag. Uh, instead of a strainer works? Absolutely, you could certainly strain it through a mesh bag. We, do, we don't recommend brewing a bag where you would use the full amount of water in the grain. You end up with um, kind of a lower alcohol beer than we've designed. So we do recommend doing the full mash and the full sparge, but you can absolutely use a nylon sack to strain and sparge through. Yeah. I'm gonna give this pot a quick rinse. Uh, somebody asked what kind of thermometer you recommend. We this is the one that comes with our kit. It's a this one long. Pretty much you need it to to go down from kind of like 60 degrees to above 170. So you want the wide range. Having something long is nice. Um, so we like using this. We have like cheese thermometers that are smaller, but then you're kind of like sticking it all around. Um, but really, if it gives you an accurate reading that's all you need and kind of to, to go from 60 degrees to about 200 degrees Fahrenheit. But we sometimes have, we have in the past used like one of those kind of meat thermometers with the probe that you can like set up and um, kind of set it and forget it and like set an alarm and like really elaborate stuff. You know, it's, um, again, those are it's, cool too. <laughs> it's, it's, what, it's what works for you. It's like, it's, it's fun and important to remember that brewing has been done for centuries and centuries when like something as simple as like the simplest thermometer was a, a bit of a luxury um so you know you can you can get by with with very little and make a really good beer i just got a question um from from wayne pa that uh what beer am i drinking and this is sloop which is a new york brewery it is their super soft ipa and uh, it is delicious. And Steven is drinking um, a Brooklyn-based brewery, Kelso. Uh, their Pilsner, which is a super easy drinking, delicious beer as well. Yeah, one of the, one of the very first breweries in, in Brooklyn. Um, it's a great, great local 
great local uh, brewery, and we, we're big fans. So I just poured the water into this other pot just because this one is um, smaller and filled to the brim and not, not fun to pour from. Um, so if you were wondering what I was doing just there. So right now I'm going to pour this over, but if you want to, to real quick, yeah, get, bring another, it closer. get another glimpse of what this looks like. I can, I can bring it closer. It's not like I'm going to burn my hand or anything. Can you use a laser thermometer? I don't know what a laser thermometer is, but it sounds rad. And if it gives you an accurate reading in something that's well, you like um, I think a laser would be like um, uh, like a forehead thermometer. Like a I mean, human? that would be one example, like an infrared thermometer. Um, you don't. Let me you, get back to you on that well, one. I would, <laughs> I would I would say no. Um, you shouldn't because you want to get the temperature throughout the grain. Um, you're gonna have different temperatures in different parts of your mash. That's why it's important to stir every like 10 or 15 minutes. Someone just asked so, about a floating thermometer as well. Similarly, you want temperature yeah because it's not it's not parts. a pot of liquid it's a pot of grain and liquid um and then during the boil you're not really taking the temperature at that point because it's a boil and it tells you that it's boiling by bubbling so i think i'm going to start sparging are you ready so with this just going to start pouring slowly and evenly in little do tight little concentric circles, just expanding outward. We say this step is kind of like making pour over coffee. So if you've made it yourself or you've seen a barista do it, you're just looking to, to slowly and evenly distribute all that water. And what this step is really doing is pulling all the color and flavor and fermentable sugars out of your grain and into the liquid that's now going to be called wort and is going to, to be your beer. So a good trick is that you can actually taste the grain now and it's going to be a little bit sweet, um, ready, delicious. And as you continue, because we're going to recirculate this uh, two or three times, and as you continue to go, the grain's going to lose that sweetness. And that's how you know it's spent and it's done and you got all the fermentable sugars from it and you're going to have those to turn into alcohol. You don't want to do this all day long um, because it will start to pull out tannins and, and other things from the grain that you don't really need. So really two to three times and just sample the grain. And if it's tasting not sweet anymore, then it's good to go to the compost or to turn into a great spent grain recipe. Yeah, this is going through nice and easy. Sometimes uh, it can start going through a little slowly. That's what is called a stuck sparge. Mm -hmm. and, and we got a comment earlier from somebody that tried to do the sparge with cheesecloth um, and like a couple layers and they got a stuck sparge from that. And that's when nothing's coming through. Um, if it's too fine, that's what you're going to run into. Uh, the best thing is to kind of just walk away, let it try and figure itself out. You can kind of get a little spoon in there to, to smooth it away. But if you're using something like multiple layers of cheesecloth or butter muslin, that's going to be too fine. And kind of like if you tried to do it through a coffee filter, that's never going through. And we'll see if you can get a little glimpse of this. It's just beginning to look beer-like. It's, um, it's gonna be a little pale. It's almost going to look like, um, it'll start to look like, I don't know, cloudy tea, if I, if I, had, to, if I had to say, say something. Um, but it's not going to have the full warmth in, co of like in color, in hue. Um, so it's going to be a little, little pallid at this point. You're going to get more color and more flavor and more sugar, more sweetness through on the second go. So we're going to just pour it through again. And if you're doing this pretty quickly and if it's going really fast, you can just do, do what we're doing and go right into it. If for some reason um, that took a long time or you got distracted and like you just had to walk away for a bit, you want to just heat this water back up to 170. But if you're going straight into it, it's, it's pretty close and you can uh, just keep going. 
Oh, somebody asked if you can make cookies with the spent grape. Yes. Absolutely. There are so many cookie recipes uh, at brooklynbrewshop.com in the blog, the mash section under spent grain chef. Uh, we've made so many cookies. They're delicious. There's also brownies and blondies and pie dough, kind of a... Yes, Anything that you could think of to do with like a whole grain flour, you can do with spent grain flour. It doesn't have the same gluten elasticity. It wouldn't be like an even swap, but um, you can definitely explore those recipes. And if there's anything that you want to see, please shoot me an email and I'll get started on trying out some new spent grain recipes. Uh, shelf life on the kits. Check your yeast packet. Um, it's going to have a little date printed on it. And if it's good if it's in the future, you're ready to brew. If not, shoot us an email. If it's like borderline, it might still be fine. Otherwise, we can get you a fresh packet and definitely get you brewing. Um, so. okay. And you'll see that the bottom of this is gonna be cloudier and murkier than the top because everything settles as you go. So I'm just gonna give this another quick rinse. Yeah. And we got a question on whether we have a good coffee stout. Um, boy, do we ever. We just did a collaboration kit with Mickler Brewing, who is totally fantastic. And we collaborated to turn their Beer Geek Breakfast, which is one of our all time favorite coffee stouts into a kit where you can make it home. So you can, it's um, online, brooklynbrewshop.com. We have it both as a kit and as a refill mix. So if you're into coffee stouts, we definitely recommend brewing that one next. And if you're not familiar with McKellar, they're amazing. Um, they have like 30 bars and uh, locations across Europe, uh, as well as a brewery in City Field where the Mets play, as well as a brew pub in Los Angeles and now Portland, Oregon and a bar that's really great in San Francisco. Yeah, um, kind of and if you're in world. Copenhagen, like pretty much every third block, you're going to hit a Mickler pub yeah, or they a even restaurant. Have a, they even have a ramen uh, shop with an automated beer dispensing can machine. It's pretty fun. So um, definitely look them up. They're always doing really great uh, things, and it's a really cool coffee stout that um, we think you'll like, and it's boozy. Um, oh, great question. Is Somebody just said they have more than a third of their jug is filled with sediment. Should they filter it before bottling? No, don't filter, but don't bottle yet. So you'll want to wait for that to settle out. It just means that it's not done fermenting. Um, when it's done, it should compact to about an inch at the bottom. So if your fermenter is still halfway or third murky, let it sit longer. Um, make sure it's at room temperature. Uh, we're coming out of winter here and there, it can still be quite chilly. So things ferment slower when it's cold. So just get that up to room temperature, see if it settles out. If it hasn't after a few more days, shoot us an email. We can give you some, some tips for possibly cold crashing or troubleshooting to see what else it could be. But for right now, not ready to bottle yet. And when we say like email us or get in touch with us, like we really mean it. We're answering questions all all the time. Um, we really pride ourselves on um, on that. So when you get a kit of ours, um, you get you know pretty much lifetime support with that. We answer questions for people that bought kits from us, um, you know, years ago. So don't don't hesitate to just let us know, um, yeah. and we'll we'll help you out. Two more quick questions. One is what size pot this is. This is an eight quart stock pot. Which is great. Um, so eight quart or a little bit larger um, would be good. And then, um, oops, I just lost my questions. Um, oh, this is a question, a good question is, does sparging it twice increase the alcohol content? Sort of. Um, so it increases how much of the fermentable sugars you're pulling out. So while each, it's not going to be like, um, so not by orders of magnitude. No, but yes. So it's going to make sure that you're getting all the fermentable sugars in the highest ABV that this beer is supposed to be. It's not going to somehow like be like adding in a bunch of extra and like up the, up the ABV to like an 8% beer. You would need more grain or more sugar to start with, um, in order to, to really increase the ABV. Um, but it is going to ensure that you're getting all the fermentable sugars from that. Yeah, you're, you're making sure the beer is living up to its potential. Yeah. 
why three times sparge? Um, just to get all the color and flavor and fermentable sugar out of it. Um, yeah. yeah, you'll 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 see, and again, like you can taste it as you go. You'll you'll taste and feel the sweetness, like kind of leaving there, um, and you'll notice the color just kind of dissipating from from the grain as well. Um, all right, yeah, so yeah. we'll call this spent grain now. Yeah, and I can bring it over one more time for you to get a good look at it. So we have all this grain that is spent. And you'll see um, as you do some more sparging, the top will almost get foamy here, um, kind of like a, the head on a beer. Um, and this will build as you go. So there's just like one more thing you'll start to notice as, as you're, as you're uh, sparging. Um, good question, somebody that when every time they open one of their beers, it starts foaming over. Uh, over carbonation is a result of having too much sugar in the beer when it's bottled. So either it didn't ferment enough um, and there was a little bit too much, too much sugar or it may have not gotten a full gallon and you added the full amount of bottling sugar and so it had a little bit too much. Um, but there are a couple of good tricks and that is to get your beer as cold as possible before opening it. So carbonation dissolves in cold liquids and in warm liquids, they all go to the top. So that's why if it's a hot day and you're at the beach and you crack open a beer, it's gonna foam over, even though that's a professionally carbonated, just forced carbonated beer, that's because carbonation all escapes in the heat. So you wanna get your beer really, really cold before you open it um, and then pour carefully and shoot us an email, we'll give you tips for troubleshooting so that your next batch isn't over carbonated. Yeah. Gas dissolves in cold. Um... That's why whales live um, in cold temperatures. Uh, good question about treating water. This is a this is something that we get asked a lot. And kind of if you like the water that you drink, then your water is good to brew with. If you filter it, or you know that you live somewhere where you have super soft or super like hard minerally water, then that's something that you might want to buy. Uh, regular filtered water for. You don't want to use distilled water, but regular regular water is good. And unless you're trying to recreate a very specific like Czech style beer, then you don't need to really be concerned with the exact water chemistry. You just more, it's like, does my water taste good? Then it will make good beer. And when you're making a gallon, that really might just mean picking up a couple of gallons of uh, bottled water and working with that. So what I just did, if um, you probably missed it, but I turned the heat on. So we collected that wort. Remember, wort is what we call beer before it's beer. Um, so we collected that and we're just starting the boil. So we're bringing this pot up to a boil. So you have it on full heat, so as high as it goes, really. Um, and you'll see over time that that foam that was at the, that, that's like formed at the top of your wort um, will start to gather, it'll, it'll get foamier and foamier, and um, we're not there quite yet, but once it gets really foamy, kind of like, um, like worst case scenario pasta, almost, well, not that bad, um, and once it, once it gets really foamy and the bubbles start breaking through, that's called the hot break, and that's when your boil has officially begun. So that's when you'll start your timer, um, and yeah. yeah, we'll go over. And we, ha we have um, a good question about the boil and somebody is making a, uh, an oatmeal stout and they want to add cinnamon and want to know when to add it. So the boil, we kind of look at as if you're making a stock or a soup. Flavors that go in at the beginning, that's going to be your background flavors. They mellow out, they're in there, but they're not like right at the surface. So that's when why you add your bittering hops right at the beginning. For this beer, we're going to use Columbus hops. Um, which we really love. We use it in our everyday IPA as well. It's a really great clean bittering hop. And same with like hearty flavors. So cinnamon is something that um, if you're using like a cinnamon stick, that's like a really good background flavor that we would add so that it's in there for either like 30 minutes, even 45 minutes. It can really hang out there. The lighter and more delicate the flavor is, you wanna add it at the end or even after the boil. 
So these Mandarin <laughs> Mandarina Bavaria. Mandarina Bavaria hops, um, which are super, super like tangerine, clementine, citrus forward. We don't want to burn that flavor off. And so we add a third of them at the end of the boil, but save most of them to get dry hopped right into the fermenter. But something like a cinnamon stick, we would throw in kind of 15 or 30 minutes into the boil and let it hang out. Yeah. So things that you want bitter and to be like really in the base of the beer you want to boil for longer, things that you want aromatic, um, delicate flavors, you add it toward the end of the boil. Okay, two more fermenter questions. Um, somebody said that the top is clear, but they're still seeing little, little like bubbles down here and whether it's ready to bottle. Yes, is, if the surface area is totally, totally clear, and it's been three weeks, then you're you're ready to bottle. Yeah, Anything I mean, down there kind of just got but, stuck down there. Yeah, as long as it's stuck, I mean, it depends on how vigorous the bubbles. I mean, like if they're really, it, if, they're, yeah. if you're really seeing bubbles, just wait. Um, but if it's still like kind of cloudy and like settling, that's, that's okay. The second question was uh, one week into their unicorn IPA and that it's starting to settle nicely but they're still seeing foam at the top one week in that makes total sense um you'll want to definitely good. wait the full two weeks never never uh try and bottle early even if it looks clear even if you're going well no one's going on vacation right now but if you had a trip planned always wait until after um leaving it in the fermenter for a couple extra weeks uh is totally fine just bottling early is a high chance that you'll get an overcarbonated beer. Yeah, when in doubt, wait. Yeah. And if anyone's curious, we do have um, little kegs on our site as well, um, and they're pretty amazing. You can actually from uh, you can actually um, condition and carbonate your beer in the keg, and instead of waiting the two weeks for bottling, um, you can have carbonated beer ready to go in two or three days, um, and it's. It's pretty foolproof and, and um, it's, it's a lot of fun. So we, we use that uh, quite a bit as well. Um, a question about the yeast. They said it's uh, once it's open, how, how long would it last refrigerated? Um, the yeast really, it's, it's, it's really the day that, that I mean, it, so I don't know why you would open and save some because all of it goes into the beer, but if you accidentally opened it and you're not ready to brew that day, totally tuck it in the fridge, that's fine. Um, they're, they're dry active yeast. It's, unless they got wet, it would, it's, they're going to just yeah, keep, the, they're the just only thing, asleep. The only thing is the moisture that could get in there, but refrigerators are pretty dry environments. Um, yeah. So just keep it in a Ziploc bag or something enclosed ideally. Um, but otherwise, a whole pack would be going in um, with your beer. Um, uh, is, can you taste the mash, and is there a way to gauge what the mash, what the beer will taste like from the mash? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, to an extent. Um, it's always going to taste grainier than your beer, but um, but different different um, different grains have different flavor profi profiles, so. Um, you know, the most, most of what goes into your beer is called a base malt, and that's going to be like, uh, grains that have the name like Pilsner or pale ale malt or like, um, things they, they often are named after the beer style that features them predominantly. And they're usually, um, they come from like regional differences. Um, so like pale ale is more of an English malt, Pilsner is more of a German or a Belgian malt. Um, and then you have crystal malts, which actually have a little crystal in there. They're also called caramel malts. Um, and they range from like, they're called crystal 10 to like crystal 120. And depending on that number, um, it's like how much actual sweetness is in there. So you're going to have like light candy sweetness up to like brown sugary sweetness up to toffee. Um, so tasting that is, is really fun. You'll really get a sense of what your beer tastes like. Um, and then you have grains that are like toasted. So you have like things like biscuit malt. Um, or aromatic malt, which tastes really like um, toasted bread, like biscuit, because it's European, it, it actually just means like cookies, you know? Um, so yeah, when you, when you taste those, um, you'll really get a sense. When you're, um, when you're kind of doing them all together, it's a mix. So tasting one grain or one, another grain is gonna be, um, you know, helpful, um, especially when you're like, you know, putting it all together uh, for the first time. Um, and you certainly could take a spoon of grain, but remember it has, uh, malted barley has like a, 
pretty thick husk, so it'll, it's not super fantastic to just take a spoon of it. It, it will get, kind of get caught in your teeth. Yeah, uh, we, we had a guy uh, at our production facility that was like, I'll just like have some, some malted barley as like oatmeal every morning, and we're like, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, it, it, there, there, there's better things. It's pretty rustic. Uh, um, there are better things. Um, but certainly taking a spoon of the wort at, at this point, you get a sense as well. Remember, yeah. it's going to just be grainier. And sweet and not, it's not going to, but yes, especially like the more you brew, you can definitely tell how it's going to taste, um, but it's not, it's not going to taste like beer yet. Um, but just to talk about the grain again, that's going to actually kind of determine what style beer you have. It's going to be the color, it's going to be the body, and it's going to be the bulk of the alcohol, unless you're adding in um, like Belgian candy sugar or additional sugars during the boil. It really determines what, what the base of your beer is going to be. And then the boil is when you add in hops and any flavors, any herbs, um, and that's kind of like where you get to experiment with flavors, but the style of beer you've brewing has already, it's already done. Like this is going to be this color beer, it's going to be this ABV, and it's going to have these characteristics because that's the grain that went into it. Yeah, so for example, we have a series of single hop IPAs that all use the same grain blend, but use different hops. And you can really taste dramatically different flavors, mostly on the aroma and you know, obviously the hop profile, um, just because you're using one hop like mosaic, which is going to be tropical berry uh, flavors like that, versus a um, cascade, which is going to be like grapefruity and herbal. A uh, couple, couple of more questions. Uh, what is our hoppiest IPA mix? Um, so if, you're, if, if hoppy to you is more bitter, then you're gonna want to look at something like our Warrior Double IPA. Um, it's it definitely has like the most hops, the highest IBUs. It's going to be the most bitter. If you're looking at hoppy, like something super aromatic and has like lots of fresh hop flavor, um, that's going to be something like our New England IPA or the Milkshake IPA, where you're doing a lot of dry hop additions um, and getting all that hop flavor, but it's going to be kind of low on the bitterness scale. So IPAs have changed a lot. Um, there's so many of them. They're so interesting. We love them, uh, but they're they're very different. So traditionally, when you thought of IPAs, you were thinking of something that was really really bitter, um, because that's what hops do when they're in a beer. They add bitterness. They add aroma. They add flavor. Um, but if you're adding them at the end or you're adding them post boil, you're losing that bitterness and just keeping the flavor. And so if that's your style of hoppy, we'd steer you to like the New England IPA. If you want something a little bit more bitter, go with the Warrior. And if you want just like a balanced IPA uh, every day or any of the single hop IPAs are really, really balanced and you're going to get that hop flavor throughout. And if there's a specific beer that you really like and are trying to like recreate, Really, just send us the, the beer name. Maybe not right here now, but um, if you email it to us, we'll you know we'll we'll look it up. We'll, uh, we'll try to figure out what will be the best one for you. Good question. Someone just asked if we're going to have the brood IPA back in stock soon. Yes. I didn't even know it was yeah. out of stock. Yeah, thanks for reminding <laughs> um, us. Yeah, we can have that. Up. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll definitely. Um, it's you know been a little bit more difficult to get everything in and get everything out quickly, but we're we're still shipping, we're still making kits, and we will absolutely get the Fruit IPA back on the site. Fruit IPA is a really fun one. It's super super bone dry. It's um very different than this IPA, but is is delicious. Um, yeah, so a Fruit IPA like a milkshake is a relatively new style of IPA, and uh, it has an amylase. Um, tablet. It's an enzyme that kind of digests the 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 starches and the proteins in your beer to make it super super dry. Um, so it's like brute has like brute champagne. Um, it's a really fun beer. It started from um, a couple breweries <laughs> out in California were making them, and people were kind of into them. And we think it, yeah, it's really it's really tasty and interesting, and it has um a really hot, uh, interesting hops that go in there too. Um, somebody else just, just said nice things about this dress and asked um, where it came from. The designer is Alexis, um, and she makes really delightful dresses. Oh, thank you. And if you're curious, 
Um, this shirt is uh, Jake. Jake Crew <laughs> Outlet. Uh, <laughs> um. And Sorry, the, the comments are coming fast and furious. I promise if I've missed any of them, we will absolutely be going through at the end and making sure to respond to everyone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the highest ABV kit is also, I believe, the Warrior Double IPA um, has the highest ABV. Yeah, although the, like the Bourbon Double um, is also, also quite high. Uh, so we have a Rum Barrel Porter and a bourbon double. So both of those are really fun. The porter is going to be darker. The Belgian, the bourbon double is a Belgian style um, double. And with those, they're, they're super boozy. You actually add a little bit of liquor. So if they come with oak chips that are charred, so it mimics the inside of a barrel. And uh, in the case of the bourbon double, you soak the oak chips in Kentucky bourbon. Uh, and and this is the bourbon double. Yeah, this is it. We brewed this, um, on Instagram live uh, two weeks ago. Um, couple couple questions is somebody had a beer that was so bubbly that um, it started coming out either the blow off tube or the airlock. That's happens happens a lot. It just means that it was a super vigorous fermentation to start. Nothing to worry about. It's gonna take a little bit of cleaning afterwards, uh, but don't disturb it now. It's great. Um, and yeah. we have a jug brush on the site. Somebody else, I think, asked like yeah, the jug brush is, uh, is quite helpful. Yeah, and about how to like get the the hard, just little crusty yeast that sometimes gets up there. Um, how to get that out? Also, shoot us an email. We can give you tips. We've um, soaked a lot of these jugs. Uh, yeah, um, the, the like ninety percent of it will come off just by um, soaking it in hot, hot water um, with a little sanitizer too helps as well. Um, and you, the earlier you can do that, the better. So if you can do it right after you're done bottling, that is gonna do um, like 90% right, right yeah. there. Letting it sit with anything, with brewing, letting something sit um, when you're done with it and you, it could be cleaned is kind of a, a fast track to being kind of annoyed with your um, Another question was how you tell the ABV of your beer. Um, you can use a hydrometer. We carry them on brooklynbrewshop.com or you can use a refractometer. Yeah, a hydrometer <laughs> or a refractometer. Refractometer is a little more expensive, yeah. um, but they use a lot less of your liquid, so which, which is nice with a gallon. Um, otherwise, a hydrometer, we do have them on the site. Um, what a hydrometer does is measures the density of a liquid. Um, it's called the gravity. So basically, um, the gravity and density, kind of synonymous. Um, but in brewing, we love jargon. So you should, I guess, learn both because otherwise you'll go on the go on the internet and, might, and you might get confused on a forum. So you measure the starting gravity and the final gravity. And because alcohol is less dense than sugary water, um, when you calculate the differences, you'll get the alcohol percentage. So you can do that with a hydrometer. Um, and you can get them on our site, you can get them, get them elsewhere as well. A couple more questions. Somebody just did a call out for the mini siphon, which I agree, it makes life so much easier. If you're really tall, siphoning is a gravity thing, so if you're tall, Steven's a pro at siphoning. I love the mini siphon because, you know, not tall, and it makes it a lot easier to do. Uh, another question was, can too much sugar or honey ruin the brew? When you're bottling, too much sugar will cause it to overcarbonate. When you're brewing, if you're adding in extra sugar, it's going to up the ABV, but it's going to um, have the potential to ferment hot so that you get kind of more apparent alcohol, like almost like if, but like mouthwash rubbing alcohol, not like a nice cocktail. Uh, so you, so if you want to add in something additional, shoot us an email, we'll tell you an appropriate amount. Um, don't just start dumping in a cup of table sugar because you want a higher alcohol beer, it's going to taste pretty lousy. Uh, the other question was, will Florida humidity mess up your beer? Um, Cause your garage is pretty uncomfortable right now. The humidity won't, but the temperature might. So you want to keep it at like 70 degrees room temperature. If you're storing it in the garage, maybe wrap it in a damp towel. Um, 
fermenting it at a higher temperature can actually do the same thing as, as adding in extra sugar. It's going to convert really fast and it's going to get some of that apparent alcohol flavor and be a, a, a lot fruitier. Um, so certain styles work great, like saisons are great to brew in warm temperatures. A fruitier IPA, it's not going to be so noticeable. Um, but if you're trying to brew something that's dry, that you'll want to try and keep it at, at a cooler temperature. So a quick interjection that our boil has now begun, and for our milk trade IPA, we're going to add our first round of hops. So these are again, these are Columbus hops, and we'll get a nice look here. So these hops have been pelletized. So hops that you usually find um, and brew with at home are pelletized. Hops are these like tall vi um, vines, basically. Um, and if you're interested in growing your own hops, now is a pretty good time, uh, the spring, to, obviously, um, to, to get to it. And with hops, you uh, want to order rhizomes, and that's a root cutting from a female plant. Only female plants flower, and so you want hops. You don't want just a crazy long vine, so don't do hops from seeds, do it from a rhizome. Yeah, and like, you can get hops sometimes at like garden centers and it's like, hey, look, a hop plant. You know, they, they might actually be hops that give you hops, maybe not. Um, just make sure that who you're buying your hop rhizomes from like cares about beer. Um, and more, more, about, more about beer than about, you know, azaleas. Although, I love a good azalea. So it asked, uh, in our uh, previous videos, we've used an induction cooktop. Um, Yes, we love them. They're great. They work with stainless steel pots. Uh, here, it would knock out the power because that was a pretty strong one. So we use that for all our test batches. Uh, but right now, we're on a regular gas stove, and it's working great. Yeah, induction is nice because we could do it in front of you uh, instead of turning around. But you know, we, we like using what you have at home. Um, so when we're often testing and, and doing most of our batches of beer on, you know, just gas gas stoves and. Um, so something that you probably might have at home. Oh, here's a great question. How long have we been brewing and when did we feel like we mastered it? So uh, as a company, we actually turned 11 this year. So, um, and we were brewing long before that. And why we love one gallon batches so much is that you can really get a handle on it pretty quickly. Um, when we're testing recipes, I'm brewing three or four batches at a time in a day to taste them and compare them next to each other. Um, if you're brewing one giant batch, it's it's hard. It's like a lot of a lot of liquid, a lot of a lot of um, kind of things, and then you have to get through fifty bottles before like you're yeah, ready we, for your next batch. We were just talking to to someone on our team who's trying his best to get through a, a, his second case of a, an Irish red ale that he brewed. That, and that he feels like it's just not it's a little too malty and doesn't hit the red ale balance quite right. Because you know when you are you know if you're the type of person that like is into making beer and you you might be like oh. really over analyzing everything and you, you always know what you might want to be doing a little bit differently on the next batch. So if you have two cases of something, um, you know you might torture yourself by the fortieth bottle. Um, whereas when you're making a whole bunch of little batches, like for example, Erica said we're making a lot of batches. So when we're testing. We have three different pots going, and then we have one larger pot, like for sparge water. So we're really making three different batches where we can try out different hop combinations, different flavors, um, different temperatures, things like that. Um, David, very nicely just said you guys can't be that old. Thank you. Yeah, um, we, <laughs> we started this company when we were uh, 23 and 25, which yeah. please don't add on 11 years to that. Um, <laughs> but. but yeah, and when we when we started, people really um, they made fun of us for a one gallon kit. They're like, no, who would want to do that? What's the what's the point? And now you know. Yeah, but Bef before we started, the smallest size was five gallons, and it was a bucket, and I couldn't lift it by myself. And everything told you to brew with like a sugar powder, and we're kind of we wanted to make brewing feel more like cooking. Like there's a lot of jargon, there's a lot of science, but there's a lot of science in all cooking, and you don't really need it in order to make a successful batch. Um, and we don't want to intimidate you. We want you to feel like you can walk into the kitchen and do this because you can, and you're gonna get a good beer. Yeah, when you're cooking a flank steak, you don't read on the internet about the Maillard reaction first. You kind of just 
do what you know works, and we want brewing to to be uh, to feel intuitive, feel like feel like cooking. Um, two two questions: uh, kegging this beer, and I also missed a nitro question earlier. Um, but ke kegging a milkshake IPA absolutely would be delicious. Um, kegging uh, is is really good um, for most styles, unless it's like a barrel aged or sour. Like kegging is great um, with. The cakes on our site, you're using CO2. If you want to do nitro, you would need a special setup to do that. Um, nitro is what Guinness is on, and it's what like cold brew coffee is often served in, and nitrogen is tinier bubbles, so it gives it a creamier mouthfeel, which actually with a milkshake IPA is delicious. Um, so if you have the capabilities to serve this on nitro, it would be superb, um, but otherwise, CO2 is good too. Uh, and then, uh, wait, uh, oh, and adding fruit, adding fruit to this beer or any beer. Yeah, adding fruit to this beer would, would, would be quite tasty. A yes. uh, strawberry milkshake would be great. Um, there's, like, depending on what you want to get out of the fruit, there's different times you can add it. You can add, um, at flame out. So flame out is the end of the boil. So, you know, we're boiling this for one hour, so 60 minutes. So it would basically be when you turn off the, when you turn off the heat, you could add strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, whatever you want, and it would be delicious. Um, another thing you could do is add them to the fermenter. Um, this is, a, you want to be careful with this if you're bottling your beer because fruit has a lot of extra sugars um, and you don't want to just introduce an extra huge amount of sugar and then wake up your beer and then bottle it because that can result in overcarbonation. But if you're kegging your beer, you can add um, fruit as long as your beer is basically going to be cold for the rest of your, you know, the beer's existence, um, so that it's not going to continue fermentation. But yeah, generally fruit you want to add uh, at a very late stage in it because you want that fruit flavor. If you're going for like a cooked fruit flavor, um, which we did an apple crisp ale, and those apples went in with cinnamon and some brown sugar, and they hung out in the pot because that's that's the flavor you were going for. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're looking for fresh fruit flavor, it, you want it to go in as late as possible. Um, if you're looking for like a cooked fruit flavor, um, then it can go in earlier. Yeah. So uh, more more beers that we um, that we have with fruit would be the Brewdog um, Elvis Juice, which has a, a ton of grapefruit. So with that, we actually um, at flame out when the when the beer is done, you take basically a half a grapefruit, just give it a big squeeze, and then you just drop the whole grapefruit in there as well. And yeah. it's just like an amazing um, grapefruit uh, flavor. That, that one is really, really fun. Um, we love, uh, we, we've done a few collaboration kits with um, some of our favorite breweries, Brewdog, McLaren, Evil Twin, um, Stillwater, Ghost of Gone Wild, and they're, they're really, really fun. They've been so fantastic to work with, and they literally just give us their brew sheet from like a commercial level, and we work on scaling it down so that you can make it at home. So we have, we, we know some pretty good secrets, but we'll never tell. Um, if, if you want some more uh, fun watching, we were actually, we did an episode of BrewDog's TV show, and in that one, just segueing back into fruit, um, we made a big apple beer because it was the Brooklyn episode and we uh, made a huge boozy like 13 percent beer and with that one we uh, added apples to the boil so they're like malted apples they, it was really tasty they blow torched the apples yeah we, was we can link to it you, you can find it on you can find it on youtube it was, it was, um, it was wonderful. so just ask what what we're drinking yeah um so this is a kelso pilsner so they're a brooklyn-based brewery um, and they're great they're super super nice um and this is uh, sloop uh it's their super soft ipa it's a really delightful and they're in New York State Brewery as well. Our next class will be drinking that bourbon double that we've been really eyeing enviously. We we're going to we we're gonna have it ready so we could drink it, but we thought we had a we needed a fermenter to show off. Alternatives to honey when bottling. Absolutely. Um, you can use agave, you can use table sugar, the amounts are going to vary. We like the taste of honey, we like the taste of maple syrup and dark berries, um, but you can absolutely use different sugars. Just shoot us an email, we have a chart of exactly what kind of sugar and how much to add for each type of bottling. Um, can essences be used? I don't know what essences are. Um, <laughs> like, we, don't use a, we don't use a ton of 
like essences or flavors? Um, like it would be like a like an extract. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. If it's if it's food grade, if it's food safe, um, just uh, you know what I would actually do is try a little bit in a finished beer, the style that you're making. Try just like a little tiny bit, see what it does in that, and then you can kind of adapt how much you would want to add, and you would want to do that at flame out or at bottling. Yeah, because very little is actually going to happen to your essence during the course of fermentation. It's not a sugar, it's not, um, it's not necessarily interacting greatly. So yeah, add, add a drop, give it a taste. You can do this with a lot of things, really. Um, you know, beer is, we, you know, we, pr we protect it, we think of it as like super pure, you pour it in a glass and you have to drink it as is, but there are no rules. Um, you know, you can, you can do anything, you can put some, you can dry hop a beer by really putting some hops that you're curious about into a beer you're drinking, and as long as, you know, the hops don't go in your mouth, Oh, yeah. um, you'll get a sense of what it tastes like. I've microplaned hops into beer. You can microplane <laughs> hops into beer. We, we have um, another recipe on our site for um, uh, deviled eggs. With yeah. beer deviled eggs and we microplane hops onto the um, deviled eggs. There's also delicious. a hop mayo that is absolutely delicious. Uh, so a couple good questions. Um, oh, why is honey used in the Michler breakfast stuff instead of maple syrup? Maple syrup would work too. There, it's not. Um, they do like a maple breakfast stout, so we didn't want to kind of go that route because it's it's a different beer. Um, but plus, you um, could definitely use maple syrup. Plus, uh, the our Michler kit is largely for our like, European audience, and maple syrup is much is much less prevalent in in Europe than it is here in North America. Um, for like a simple kind of logistical question, but. Um, when, what do you use for lavender flavor? Dried food grade lavender is delicious. We use it in a lavender blonde. It's one of my all time favorite beers. Yeah, so. you, you would Love add it. that at Flame Out because remember, if you're thinking about lavender, it's a really delicate flavor. Um, we made a huge batch for our wedding for when we, when we got married. If you haven't guessed, we are married. Um, we, made, um, eight, we made like 50 gallons of, of beer for that, and our lavender blonde was one of them. It was a really good um, dessert beer. Um, somebody asked after three days of using the sanitizer with the blow up tube, if they can use that same sanitizer from the bowl for their airlock, as long as it's clear, absolutely sanitizer does keep, but if you had a super vigorous fermentation where that there's like hot matter or like so something got into the bowl, then you'll want some fresh sanitizer. You're only using half your pallet, packet on brew day, so you should still have half a packet left um, for for bottling day, and you can make that early and just store it in a jug. But yes, as long as it's clear, as long as there's nothing in it, you can absolutely use the uh, sanitizer from your blow up. But, but if you can get away without doing that, it would be preferred. So um, I know on the packet of sanitizer, we have like instructions on how to make a gallon of it, but you can eyeball smaller amounts. So like you can really take like an eighth of a teaspoon, something really tiny, add it to like, we're talking a quarter cup of water and you're, you're great, so like a pinch. But if you ran out of sanitizer entirely, we get it. Um, we have a ton of sanitizer. Um, so if you need more, it's pretty, it's, it's relatively inexpensive on our site. Um, uh, my favorite comment was somebody uh, on, on social media, all our, our Brooklyn Brew Shop across uh, Instagram and Facebook and spelled a little bit weirder on Twitter, but we're there too. Uh, they posted a picture of the kit and they said, this kit came with a thermometer and a packet of sanitizer, so I think it's a really good deal in this time. And I, that made me laugh. Um, so, uh, bottling questions. Um, two of them. And the first one is, do you have to bottle? Yes. Um, yeah, you can bottle or keg, but at the end of fermentation, your beer is going to be flat. And beer carbonated is nice. Oh, it's kind of like what beer is supposed to be. So we do recommend either using uh, cap burn caps with some non-twist off beer bottles. You can use swing top bottles. Um, anything that held a carbonated beverage that has a good seal, you can use or you can keg. Um, you can't, you don't you want to ferment it in the, the jug. jug, and we don't recommend moving it into like two of the thin walled glass growlers because they're not really um, pressure, like they can't withstand they're, that much they're, pressure. They're okay for like, a growler is okay for service, but not for conditioning. Yeah. 
Um, the other question is, when bottling, does the size of the bottle uh, affect the carbonation of the beer? Yes. So smaller bottles, like we say two weeks for bottling. Um, two weeks is pretty standard for like a 12 ounce beer bottle, thereabouts, normal size beer bottles. If you're bottling in something a little bit larger, wait a few extra days. It just does take a little bit longer for it to get fully carbonated. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so this this beer is one of the those beers that's actually pretty easy. Um, some of them you're doing constant things during the boil. You're setting your timer every ten minutes. You have to come back and add something. This one, you literally you just add the Columbus hops in the beginning, wait till the end, and then that's when your lactose sugar goes in, and just a third of these uh, Mandarina Bavaria hops, and then the two other parts of it we're going to add in two dry hop additions when it's in the fermenter along with vanilla bean oh. yeah, and the vanilla bean is optional but it's what kind of takes it from um lactose ipa and makes it into like a you know vanilla milkshake ipa and it's 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 really fun and that goes in um well after so that goes in during fermentation so once your beer is already in the jug um, and then just a, a quick recap for what we've done so far. The first step was the mash. We heated up water to 160 degrees, added in our grain, and then let that sit up for an hour um, at about 154 degrees, just keeping warm. We then mashed out, brought it up to 170 degrees, and sparged, which is where we used a strainer over a pot, poured over additional hot water and collected all that liquid that's going to be our beer and said goodbye to our grain that will will compost probably later uh, and now we're on to the boil so on your brew day you do the mash sparge boil and you start fermentation so once this hour is up we're going to cool it down to 70 degrees we do it in just an ice bath in the sink there was a question earlier but if you don't have any ice right now, um, I've done it with like a couple like ice packets as well that just might be hanging out in the fridge. It takes a little bit longer. You can also just do it with cold water. It will bring it down faster than if you're just letting it sit down and like trying room temp. Um, but if you could just do cold water, it'll bring it back down pretty fast. It's, it's a small batch and you'll just want to switch out that water as it gets warm. Um, And then you ferment, sorry. <laughs> All these questions coming yeah, through. Yeah, we, we're, we're pleasantly surprised at the number of questions yeah. we've been getting. We've been getting really a ton of questions from all over the world. Yeah, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Yeah. This has been so amazing. Yeah, um, we know you, have, you don't have to be with us on, on this beautiful day. So, And you are, and we thank you. Um, so this is a beer that's been fermenting for a couple of weeks. It's our bourbon double. But if this was today's brew day, we would transfer after this chilled down to 70 degrees we would then move it into our fermenter um we use a funnel that has a little screen which is great <laughs> yeah, it's not it, it, it usually hangs right here but it's not um and we have it on our site it's a funnel the, the screen is really tiny so when someone asked about having a beer with a lot of sediment at the bottom one way you could fix that is with a screen inside of a funnel that helps a lot you can also um, when you're filling your fermenter put your stainless steel strainer, your mesh strainer over it, and that'll get some things. For the most part, you know, your, your, hop, your hop matter will dissolve and still kind of get through, but that's, that's okay. When um, you are pouring into your fermenter, you may just want to leave a little bit at the bottom of the pot. That's going to be your, like, sludgy hop matter. A uh, couple, couple more questions um, is... Um, oh, sorry. So many questions, so many questions. Uh, what is the key to knowing your bottled beer is ready? So we say move one to the fridge. Uh, we normally do it after like 10, 11 days because we're a little impatient. Uh, we want, want to drink that beer faster. So you can move one to the fridge and then try it the next day. If it's at the right carbonation level, then you can move them all to the fridge and keep them there. If it is low, then you'll want to let it ferment for a few more days at room temperature or bottle condition. And similarly, if you are using a double lever capper like the one we have on our site, um, it'll, it will make a slight indentation in your bottle cap. <laughs> and you'll notice that it might 
start puckering very slightly uh, when it is uh, ready to go. So, yeah, let's see. So, we have another question for you, Mr. Uh, so, um, we had a question about measuring out yeast quantities if you are doing a recipe from one of our books. Um, basically, uh, by weight is great, so if you're using like a commercial packet of yeast, a five gallon is generally 11 grams. Um, our packet of yeast is roughly just a little over three grams. Um, so um, ours is maybe a little better. So if you're using like a, f a regular packet of yeast, you can just use half of it and you'll be okay. We need to switch places. This is yeah. weird. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and with the boil, you're going for a low boil. So still bubbling, but you don't want to reduce the liquid too much um, so that when you pour it in, you get the full gallon. This is a really common thing, question we get, is that you did your whole brew day, you cooled it down, you poured it into your fermenter, and it's, it's coming up a little bit short. And that's totally fine, totally normal, it just means that too much kind of boiled off, and you just want to top that off with cold water um, to bring it up so that you're getting the full gallon. You just kind of concentrated your beer a little bit. Yeah. So, this has now been boiling for around 20 minutes or so. We're probably not going to do the full boil because we're, it's really, this is one of the lesser active boils. It really is just, um, at the end, we add a third of the mandarina, Bavaria hops, and the lactose. If you want to get a better look at the lactose, it is a super, super fine sugar. It's, um, you can, you know, you know get a little taste. Um, it's not going to be super sweet, it's going to be pretty milky, um, and it's going to dissolve right in your beer. Um, it's not going to give you any additional alcohol, even though sugar usually gives you alcohol, but lactose is entirely unfermentable. It's just going to give you a um, little smooth, milky mouthfeel. Um, what we said earlier about you can add something to your finished beer. If you are kind of curious and you want to just see what lactose would add to a beer, um, you can really add a very small spoon of it to a finished beer and you'll get a little understanding of what your beer would be like if it were a milk stout or if it were a, you know, if you had a New England IPA you wanted to add a little bit, you can get a basic understanding of what a milkshake IPA might be. Uh, question is how long you leave the fruit in after the boil. Normally we'll leave things in through cooling it down to 70 degrees and then when it's going into the fermenter we'll catch it um, with either a strainer or a funnel with a filter so that it's not going into the fermenter. So it has time, all that time to cool down and really get all that flavor out. Yeah, and we have a recipe, I think it's actually on YouTube, um, for a malted apple ice cream, if you, um, if you want to make it. Um, it's on our website as well, but it's with our apple crisp ale, and you can actually make an ice cream with the apples that you use in your beer. Um, will we come out with any lagers? We, so to make a lager, um, lager yeast likes colder temperatures than you like to live in. So the thing that's great about ale yeast is that they ferment at room temperature. Lager yeast are, need to be at a colder temperature that's warmer than your fridge, but colder than like living, living temperature. So um, you would need to like convert a fridge or find like a cave underneath your house to put it in. Um, so we, we don't really offer kits for them, but we do love lagers and we have a couple recipes in our books, but for the most part, all, all our kits are ales. Yeah, but um, we mentioned the brewed IPA earlier. That's like a super dry IPA. So if you like the dryness and the crispness of a lager, that'll probably be um, your best your best bet. It will be hoppy like an IPA, however. Um, question, oh, it's on five gallon kits. We have five gallon mixes, um, but not the equipment. Um, but we do offer some of our recipes in five gallon size and in both our books, uh, Brooklyn Brew Shop's beer making book and make some beer small batch recipes from Brooklyn to Bamberg. All the recipes are in one gallon and five gallon size. All right, two more questions. And then I think that uh, we, are, we are leaving you guys to your own brew days. Um, but if we did not ca catch it, please shoot us an email, info at brooklynbrewshop.com or leave it here. We're on social and we're so, so grateful for you guys for tuning in, for making beer with us. 
Yeah, and really, um, if any questions again, email us. Um, get in touch with us. We love, we love, love, love seeing your beers. Um, so just post post your beer. You can do hashtag Brooklyn Beer Shop or at Brooklyn Beer Shop, and we'll we'll you know we'll, we'll comment. We'll, we'll um, let you know if, if it looks good or not, or if we spot any <laughs> spot anything that you should know. <laughs> Somebody just said that there's a like a red lot stirring device that <laughs> that exists when you're brewing. Um, Cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean automation. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a, there's some fun stuff out there, uh, but also all you really need to get started is a pot, a strainer, and a funnel, and um, all the equipment in our kit will get you through your first batch. And then if you want to go crazy with the Lego sets that you can hook up to robots, by all means, please send us the video because yes. we would love to see yeah. that. I love little robots. Um, again, I'm Erica. This is Steven. We're Brooklyn Brew Shop. All our kits are at brooklynbrewshop.com. We are still shipping. We can still get you ingredients to make some beer. And if you're interested in other fermentation projects like pickles, sauerkraut, fermented hot sauce, kombucha, check out farmsteady.com. We have a really great YouTube channel as well. And please send us your questions. We are so glad that you got to be in our kitchen today and we're happy to help you out in your brew day in whatever kitchen you're in all right thanks guys thank you bye